People searching for a closer relationship with God and for the strength that comes from a knowledge of His Word. The Huntington Park Church of Christ in Shreveport, Louisiana, in partnership with area congregations of the Church of Christ, proudly present a search for direction. Good day and welcome to A Search for Direction. I'm Floyd Johnson, minister for the Huntington Park Church of Christ here in Shreveport, Louisiana, and your host for today's broadcast. We have been usually, and it has become our custom, giving you a brief explanation as to why we want to be in your homes in the first place. We only have one goal, and that's to help you have a greater knowledge of the Bible, the Word of God. That's our only purpose. You will not find us ever asking you for funds or money. Anything we offer by this broadcast will always be yours absolutely free for the asking. This co program is sponsored by area congregations of the Churches of Christ and individual members of the Churches of Christ. We want this to be a tool to help you have a greater knowledge of the Word of God. Now, I'd like to tell you about a couple of tools. One is an eight-lesson Bible correspondence course. Now, the beauty of this course is not only its simplicity, but the fact that it'll take you through the entirety of the Bible in all eight lessons. When you are finished, you'll receive a certificate of completion. A difference more than that, we think you'll have a greater knowledge of the Word of God. We also have a DVD we'd like to send you. Maybe you're interested in the title. I hope you are. Why are there so many churches? Don Blackwell does an extraordinary job of going back to what the Bible says about the church of the New Testament and the history of so many denominational groups. Why are there so many? Did Jesus actually determine to build churches? Or was he sincere in Matthew 14 he said, when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Well, now the DVD and the Bible correspondence course are yours simply for the asking. At the end of our broadcast, the announcer will give you both a mailing address and a phone number, and you can use either one of those to contact us. We'll get those items in the mail to you as soon as we possibly can. If someone were to come to you today and ask you, are you saved? What would your answer be? Well, I think most people in what we call the Bible Belt would affirm, yes, I think I'm saved. But on whose account are you saved? How do you know that you're saved? What philosophy of salvation do you use that gives you the confidence to say, I am saved? Is your salvation based on what the Bible teaches about salvation? Or is your salvation based upon some doctrine or creed of man? You know, there is a vast divergence between those two things. I want to relate to you, and if you have your Bibles... Join with me in Matthew 19. We're going to begin our reading with verse 16 of the text. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? Well, he's come to the right place and he's asking the right question. He's come to Jesus. But notice Jesus' response when he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now keep in mind, Jesus said this before his death and his resurrection. So this young man was still living under the old law or under the Old Testament. We don't live under that law today, but the answer that Jesus gives is applicable. Jesus said, and then the young man said to him, and I've always perceived, maybe wrongfully so, that the young man in a rather arrogant voice said, which one? Then Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you can see at the start that this young man is of a very exemplary character, isn't he? Jesus says you need to keep the law, and he says, What? What parts? Then Jesus announced this, and uh, the young man answered and said, all of these things I have kept since my youth up. You'd have to applaud that young man. But Jesus, and then he asked, what do I lack yet? 
Is there anything I haven't done that I need to do? Anything I need, anywhere I need to go that I haven't gone? Then Jesus answered, said to him. This is in verse 21 of our text. If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Well, obviously, the young man, as we continue reading in our text, uh, was apparently very wealthy. Because he says, then the young man, when he heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This has always troubled me. That young man is now dead and gone. Whatever possessions he had are probably passed into the dust. And yet, on one day, at one time, on one occasion, he will stand again before Jesus, having lacked that one thing. What a tragedy to be in the presence of Jesus and have the opportunity being in the presence of Jesus to follow him and to have a life exemplary and one that has purpose and that leads to eternal life with Jesus Christ. When the, then Jesus said to his disciples, I say surely unto you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly disturbed, saying, Who then can be saved? Oh, that question just kind of tears the heart of all of us, doesn't it? In this country, for most people, we are quite well-to-do. In many other countries, that is not the case. Now, whether you would call yourself rich or not, Most of us are quite comfortable with what we live and how we live and where we live. So the answer that Jesus gave and the question that was asked, who can be saved? Now I go back to our original question at the beginning of our broadcast. Are you saved? And upon what category or what teaching do you base that salvation? Important questions, aren't they? Now, you may not be affluent as some are. You may not have as much as others have. <clears throat> That's perceivable. We understand that. But what Jesus is dealing with here is an attitude. The young man said, what do I lack yet? I think he was convinced he really didn't lack anything. He had kept the commandments from his youth up. That's inspirational. But when Jesus confronted him with that one thing that he lacked, He went away sorrowful. Now, dear friends, when it comes to our own salvation, I want us to go next to verse 26 of our text. Then Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. If you and I are saved, and hopefully we are, it'll be because we have a relationship with God, established and based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have hope, the promise of eternal life. Without that, there is none. In fact, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Well, that goes to the crux of the problem, doesn't it? What do I lack yet in my own salvation? Now, as we said a moment ago, we're not under the Ten Commandments. We understand that that was the Mosaical Law. Jesus gave a new law, a new covenant. Now, for those who have problem dealing with that, simply read Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10, and that will answer any question you have on that. In fact, go to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus makes a statement. This is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It has been said of those of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, now notice the difference, whosoever looketh upon a woman with lust toward her has committed adultery adultery already in his heart. So, uh, quite a difference between the old law, which prohibited the act, and the new law, which deals with the heart of the individual who wants to commit the act. The thought is the father of the deed. As a man thinketh in his heart, Jesus said, so is he. So, in in those things necessary for my salvation... I think it's imperative that we deal with the question, what do I lack yet? Now, we need to understand where salvation comes from. 
You don't earn your salvation. We understand that. Salvation comes through the grace of God and manifest in the death of His Son. That does not mean that there are not obligations and responsibilities on becoming a child of God. It is a gift, obviously. It is a free gift, the Ro Paul in Romans tells us, but a gift not accepted is no gift at all. Surely we understand that. In the 1800s, there was a man, I can't remember the name of the state he was in, but he was convicted of a crime and was to be put to death. Well, the governor of that particular state reviewed the case and thought that he should be pardoned. So the governor granted him clemency, pardoned, but the man refused it. Well, I don't know if it went all the way to the Supreme Court, but it went all the way to the top of the state's courts. And they ruled that a pardon unaccepted is no pardon at all. Well, the same thing is true of our salvation. A gift is a gift only when it is accepted. Otherwise, it is no gift at all. So there are responsibilities and obligations inherent toward the gift of salvation that God gives us. Now, notice what Jesus said to the young man who in his own confidence said, I've kept all of these from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now, I may be wrong in my assumption, but I've always thought that this young man was rather arrogant. I've done this from my youth up. Is there anything I, you know, kind of saying, what do I lack yet? I've done all this. And then when Jesus told him to go and sell what he had and give to the poor, oh, that was a crowning blow. Why? Because he had much possessions. What would you give up to be saved? What do you need to do to be saved? How many things are involved in our salvation? And do we lack one thing? Now, the question is, can one thing really cost me my salvation? Well, that one thing that that young man lacked cost him a relationship with Jesus Christ, didn't it? Well, it did. So, obviously, we need to consider what's required of my salvation under the new covenant and determine if I lack anything yet. So, let's consider it. I believe there are five things inherent in the nature of salvation. There are actually 50 things that are part of our salvation. We're not going to take the time in our broadcast today to note all 50 things. But we're going to notice those key essentials that brings us into a relationship with God. First of all is faith. That's obviously, isn't it? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Now, that's interesting. Faith comes, is produced by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. The Hebrew writer says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Now, sadly, in some religious affiliations, faith is the total substance of their salvation. But, dear friends, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that faith is that essential agree, uh, ingredient that leads us to the other ingredient. It's like making a cake. Now, I'm no expert at making a cake or biscuits, whatever you want to do. There are recipes. So you take down Grandma's recipe and you read it. It takes so much flour, so much this, so much that, so much. Now, uh, let's say there's five ingredients and you put all four ingredients except one. Uh, what kind of biscuits do you think you're going to have? Well, they won't be very platable, will they? In fact, most people probably wouldn't eat them. Because why? You've left out that one essential ingredient. And so it is with faith. Faith, faith is the foundation upon which those other characteristics of obedience are determined. So we must emphasize the necessity of faith for our individual salvation. You can't please God without it, and we understand that. But faith is not some magical, mystical phenomenon, as some people believe it would. Oh, I've heard individuals say, well, you know, faith came to me in the middle of the night, or faith came to me when I heard such and such a preacher. Well, dear friends, that's, I'm sorry, that, that's utter nonsense. That's not where faith comes from. Faith comes through a knowledge of the Word of God, which reveals to us the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Paul writes to the church in Corinth where he says uh, that Jesus was seen by over 500 individuals, many of whom had fallen asleep, but 200 remain alive. These were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, and if I might add this appendage, I see vans and churches that say the preacher is apostle so-and-so, apostle this and that. I'm sorry, cannot be. For an individual, for a man to be an apostle, he had to be a witness to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those things were necessary for an individual to be the apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, obviously no one in our world today can make that claim. It simply can't be. It's nonsensical. So, we have faith, repentance. Now, you'll find all of these ingredients in Acts 2, 37 and 38. Repentance. Jesus said, nay, except you repent, you shall perish in your sins. Ooh, that's kind of a blow, isn't it? I thought faith was all. No, 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 there's repentance. Repentance, as I understand it, was actually a marching order in the Roman army. If you were going a certain direction, I'm not familiar with the Latin, obviously, they would call repent, and you would turn around and go the other way. So repentance is a change of direction, a change of heart. Now, Paul, in writing again to the church at Corinth, said, Godly sorrow not to be repented of. Dear friends, repentance is not sorry you got caught. Repentance is sorry that you did it in the first place. Sometimes little children, when confronted with some act that they had done, the mother would say, aren't you sorry? And, well, to forestall a beating, what's that child going to say? Well, yes, mother, I'm sorry. And uh, perhaps not really mean it. Do you know how you can tell if repentance is usually genuine? when you no longer do what brought the repentance in the first place. Now, that doesn't mean you won't sin. John says in 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have, that's the Christians. If you say we have no sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is willing and just to forgive us of our sins. So you add to your faith repentance, that change of direction, that change of heart. It's like a letter that someone wrote to the IRS on one occasion, said, I'm sending a check for $5,000 because of a guilty conscience. If this doesn't get rid of my guilty conscience, I'll send the other $5,000 later. <laughs> well, obviously the man wasn't repentant. Uh, maybe he was afraid he was going to get caught by the authorities. I don't know. I don't even know if that's a true story, but it's humorous anyway. So faith, repentance, confession. Jesus says, he that will confess me before men, the same will I confess before my Father in heaven. He that denies me before my Father, him will I deny before my Father. Or denies me before men, I will deny before my Father. The Roman letter in Romans 10 says, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, let me pose a question to you. Which of these three items that we've talked about so far are the most essential? Now keep in mind the recipe that we talked about. You can't leave out any of them. They are all necessary for our salvation. But religions will stop on any one of these. If you believe, that's enough. If you repent, that's enough. If you'll come forward and confess Christ as the Son of God, that's enough. And yet the recipe is not complete. You only have three of the items necessary to bring about a relationship with God through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So faith, repentance, confession. Oh, and I left one out. Knowledge. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Knowledge is the key to all of these other things that we've talked about. You cannot do what you do not know. But dear friends, on the day of judgment, when, when we stand before the judgment seat of God to give an account, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, give an account of the things we've done in the flesh, whether good or bad, ignorance will not serve as an excuse. Well, it doesn't in everyday public affairs, does it? Have you ever had a police officer put his lights on and ask you to, for your license and proof of him? Well, sure. And if you said, oh, well, 
Officer, I didn't know that. Is that going to work? Well, of course not. That's not going to work. Ignorance, what is how ignorance of the law is no excuse. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men to repent, he writes in 2 Corinthians. All men to repent. No exceptions. All are responsible. All, all are amenable to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sad thing about denominationalism, dear friends, is that it short circuits the things necessary for your salvation, the things that you ought to do and are not doing. Like the young man asked, what do I lack yet? And you may have been convinced that you've done all you need to do. Have you? Have you really done all that you need to do? Knowledge, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. I have never understood why baptism is such a controversial subject. There's as much teaching on the subject of baptism in the New Testament, almost as much as there is on the necessity of faith. And yet individuals will accept all of the things we've mentioned except when it comes to baptism. And then, oh no, oh I can't, oh I won't. Why my mother, my father, whatever would be, no wait a moment. Whatever you do or do not do is not going to affect the salvation of your mother and father at all, but it will impact your own salvation. God is the final judge and arbitrator of all of these things. But you can believe, still not be saved. James says even the devils believe and tremble. You can repent and still not be saved. You can confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and still not be saved. What lack I yet? Dear friends, if you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins into the body of Jesus Christ, that's the one thing you're lacking. That's the one thing, like this rich man, that one thing in his life that he could do but he would not. Why? Because he loved his possessions. Remember the parable of the farmer who had a bountiful crop? I believe that's in Matthew. And uh, he said to himself, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my old barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'll say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. And then the voice of God came and said, thou fool, this night thy soul will be required of thee. Then whose things will these be? Well, they will not be his anymore. That young man in his possessions, he doesn't possess those possessions. The only thing he really possessed was the thing he neglected, and that was his soul. He doesn't possess that. It's like the two men that were at the graveside of a friend, a rather wealthy friend, and one turned there and said, well, I wonder how much he left behind. <laughs> the old man said, I think he left it all behind, and that's true for all of us. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth, where rust and moth corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break through and steal. So these are the things necessary for our salvation. Have you done them? If you haven't, what's keeping you from doing them? Well, you might respond, well, oh, I just don't know that I believe that. Well, no, wait a minute. What part of it do you not believe? Do you, do you not believe in the knowledgeable part? You can't do what you don't know. That's obvious. Study to show thyself approved, as we mentioned in 2 Timothy 2.15. Well, do you not believe in the belief part? Well, I don't know anyone trying to be a child of God who doesn't believe in the necessity of belief. In fact, some religions tout that as the only thing you need to do to be saved. Oh, they'll put it in these words, Accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Accept Jesus Christ into your life. Well, that's all good and meaningful, but wrong. It's wrong, dear friends. So, here's, here's the key. Are you going to argue about faith? Are you going to argue about repentance? Well, maybe it's confession. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Well, certainly not. But are you going to reject any of those things? Well, no, I'm not going to reject any of them. Why are you rejecting that final act which places you in a relationship with God? 
Luke says in Acts 2, verse 47, And God added to the church daily those that were being saved. What did those who were being saved do? They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. After having believed and repented and confessed, they were baptized. So that's what you and I are going to have to do if we haven't. Otherwise, we will be lost. Tragic consequences of that one thing that you lack. Well, you don't have to lack. That young man could have followed Jesus, but he didn't because he loved his wealth more than he loved Jesus. I don't know what you love that may hinder you from doing what God wants you to do. I'm not privy to that information. But whatever it is and whatever you have and whatever difficulty presents itself to keep you from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to get rid of it. You will leave this world sooner or later, as we all will. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. So I pose again this question. Are you saved? And who said so? Who told you that you were saved? Is your salvation based upon what the Word of God teaches or not? Now, the plan of salvation, if you wish to call it that, is not difficult to understand until the doctrines and the creeds and so forth of men get in the way. Is that your hindrance? Maybe it's a family relationship. Mother and father, son or daughter. Jesus said, he that loveth mother and father, son or daughter, brother and sister more than me is not worthy of me. Dear friends, when your life is almost over and you breathe that final breath, the only thing that will matter is are you saved according to the will of God, according to the blood which bought the church, Acts chapter 20. I promise you, nothing else on this earth will matter to you. Thank you for being with us in our broadcast today, and may God bless each of us in our search for direction. I am thine, o Lord, I am we want to thank you for being with us in our broadcast today. If you'd like to enroll in a free Bible correspondence course or to receive a free CD of today's lesson, you may do so by calling us at 318-686-0873 or by writing us at Huntington Park Church of Christ, 6161 West 70th Street, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71129. Tell your friends about us and join with us again next week as together through God's Word we continue our search for direction. Jesus.